All right, one key talking point this week, and that was uh, the withdrawal of the trainer's license of Milton Harris. The licensing committee found him not to be a fit and proper person to hold a trainer's license. The license at his Sutton Veeney Yard is currently held temporarily by Anthony Charlton, though reapplication will be required once this case is over. Milton Harris has said that he may well appeal, though has not fleshed it out much more than that. Uh, there were three key issues in this case one of financial. Uh, irregularity, one of safeguarding uh, and one of uh, bullying and, har and harassment of a neighbouring trainer. Uh, Richard, if you want to uh, have first go at this, it's quite shocking some of the detail of this case, uh, which was laid bare in a very, very long document in a behind closed doors hearing. It's a licensing committee hearing, not a disciplinary committee hearing, so that's not unusual in that regard. Yes, no, that, that, that's fair comment. Um, I was quite taken by how um, it was written up in quite colourful language, no doubt reflecting the um, evidence that had been given. But first of all, it is, looking in from the outside, um, an open and shut case in the sense that um, there's a massive amount of evidence to trawl through there and we've only seen probably selected parts of it. But it's impossible for any of us to stand and defend any of the actions that were taken. So I think it's important to try and discuss it on a wider issue and say how vulnerable is racing in its structure, in its breadth of ages and the fact that there is some degree of sort of coercive control. If I want to get on within a yard as a young individual or a young rider, I am at the behest of often just one or two individuals. The apprentice uh, system went an overhaul with the conditional jockeys a few years ago to try and uh, release that slightly. And the second thing I think is very much that you wonder how on earth it was allowed to go on for this long, given that the licence had been issued with conditions that had clearly looked as if they were being breached. And so I would l suggest yeah. that we need to be a little bit no nimble-footed when things have been identified and actually acting on them, rather than patting ourselves on the back when we pr can produce masses of evidence. Well, surely even half that evidence would have been enough to main maintain that the, the individual concern is not a fit and proper person. Yeah, just for clarity, the licence was granted in 2018, having been withdrawn initially in 2011, on the basis that one, Milton Harris would not be a director of a, a company uh, that, that was involved in running the yard, and two, that he would not trade bloodstock, and he was found in the evidence to have breached both those conditions. But obviously, uh, the, the headlines were safeguarding issues as regards young females under his uh, employment, either permanent or temporary, and also uh, quite a, um, a colourful outburst at uh, fellow trainer Simon Earle, which was laid bare in all its uh, lurid detail, Maddie. Yeah, indeed. And Harry and I were speaking outside beforehand about the makeup of a lot of yards. And naturally, there are going to be a lot of people straight out of racing school. I think you were saying around 50% of your staff would be, say, under 25. And when you've got sort of young women who are naturally at that age, I suppose, impressionable, or, as Richard said, wanting to do well, um, it's incredibly worrying when you have people like Milton Harris in those positions of power who can just totally neglect their role. Um, and that was really, really concerning for me to read. Yeah, as I said, he, he has announced that he's, well, he's not announced, but he's indicated that he may well appeal this case. And I think that, uh, plus his appearance on, on this programme, on this sofa, when he, he talked about the way that he interacted with some of his, his younger staff and said that some of the older staff told him it wasn't a great thing to do, but, you know, this was just the way, the way he was probably gives you a pretty good indication as to the gap between what he perceives is OK and what the rest of society thinks is yeah, I mean, OK in terms of relations between employer and employee. Absolutely. And, and racing's unusual in the sense that if you want to make a generational change in, say, cricket, we've just talked about football, your participants are largely between 20 and 35. So as a result, the younger generation come in and they move through. Within racing, you have a far greater spread of ages within the industry, trainers often being at the upper end of that. And it, as a result, I do think generational change is far harder to achieve when you have that, rather than when you have a higher churn or turnover of participants. And it's staffing and the requirement for safeguarding has moved on immensely in the last 10 to 20 years. These sort of incidents just made me concerned that there's many more instances which now, through the microscope of current society thinking, would not be looked on favourably. And there's a further point to this, which is if you are employing people on an occasional basis who are still at school and even under 16 for casual work at the, at the weekend, I, I don't know where, where the law stands on that as regards 
um, how you em you employ casually, you know, your children who are who are really quite young. Yeah, I think the the key thing here is that um, you know there's a standard of um, care that you need to give to these members of staff, and they need to feel safe in their working environment and feel respected. And um, it's clearly been cases where they haven't been. Okay, right. We will move on. Willie, 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 Willie. That was the result in the Grade 1 Spring Juvenile yesterday and was pretty much the result in most races. He won all four Grade 1s yesterday. Uh, he's got a match today in the Novice Chase, we've just found out. Two stable companions taking one another on with both Gordon Elliott out and Grange Clare West out. Um, it's the top two in the betting in the Irish champion hurdle. Now, no one has anything but admiration for what Willie Mullins has achieved and built up. It's groundbreaking, it's history making, it's epoch defining as regards national hunt racing. But we're getting to quite a worrying point of non-competitiveness, aren't we, for this marquee festival, Maddie? Yeah, we definitely are. We have the caveat of Gordon Elliott saying and acknowledging that obviously he wasn't going to field his, his usual team of horses, partly due to the, the dispersal of the Coldwell construction horses mm. who were unable to run. Um, but even still, this, this dominance is just staggering. Um, I looked at the, the cards on the, the Monday and went through and it was sort of, he's got 11 of the 23 entries in this. He's got 14 of the whatever entries in this. And it's really worrying because although Willie Mullins does consent to run his horses against each other, we've seen him do that on many occasions, it, it's not great that he's the one who's controlling the sport at this level. Mm. Yes, because that's the point, isn't it? It's not so much that he he's not a, a sportsman because all these horses will, will do their thing in the races they are. And he had three non-first strings winning yesterday. So he's kind of playing the game the right way in that sense but your advantage Richard if you have five rather than one in the race is more than five times the yeah you, you know. can you know you can gang up we've seen um you know Aidan O'Brien using it to very good effect in derbies in open years two at the front two in the middle you know one at the back cover all of the run styles we haven't spoken at all so far on this program you know about the punter and this is my main concern here. I have no problem with Willie Mullins dominating in terms of quality. He is the best. He is entitled to attract one of I don't want um, restrictions. But I do feel if you are a punter and you see four horses out of five from the same stable, you feel they know more than you. And as a result, I feel it is a very big disincentive for people to get involved, even if they're being campaigned on their merits. Take the Harry. Yeah, Harry, you might have one good horse. We've all got horses against you. You know yours really well. You don't know ours. If you have four of the five, you know exactly what's happened to them day in, day out. Who stood on a stone? Who did this? Who did that? And I think from a punter, that is a real disincentive to bet. And let's face it, punters fund the sport. And that is why, of course, there was, I think, significant disquiet at the comments from Patrick Mullins after Gaelic Warrior beat il temps in the race yes. at Limerick. And Gaelic Warrior goes this afternoon to pot around in his match race. Could have run yesterday, was going to run yesterday, then wasn't going to run yesterday, Maddie. And... Uh, how, how did you feel about that in terms of the way the narrative played out? It's, we're seeing it more and more, aren't we? I mean, bless Nicky Henderson, he's the one who usually gets sort of gets the stick for, for saying he's going to run a horse and then changing his plans with Constitution Hill. But uh, in this case, you're talking about novice chasers who have loads of ability, but with Gaelic Warrior, we don't really know the, the conditions where he's going to be seen to best effect. And Willie's saying that, well, Fasal Vega put in a magnificent piece of work, which didn't do him any good, clearly, um, which swayed them towards the shorter distance race. I, I do have sympathy for trainers because they want to try and keep people um, up to date. They want to try and keep people informed. Um, and, you know, as, as journalists, we want to get people excited for, for things to look forward to. But equally, they're entitled to change their mind. And, you know, as I'm sure Harry will tell you, training horses is very much a minute to minute basis. Things change and, and plans need to be reshuffled. And when you've got as many very, very good horses as Willie Mullins has, that's inevitably going to happen. But of course, I was disappointed. Um, have you found dealing with media inquiries different since you actually started training? Have you, had, have, you, have you developed a different view as to how much you will reveal and how much you will tell people? Be careful. <laughs> um, I probably have, but I think the key is declarations of 48 hours before. Whatever is said before that, it's only a person's opinion at the time. And, um, like, I had a very low-grade winner on Thursday, Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock. He worked OK. I took him out of the race and then an hour later I looked at the race closely and thought 
actually, I still think he can win. So now, obviously, that's not played out in the public eye because it's an auto hundred and five round win Canton. But trainers are changing their minds all the time because you're dealing with a living and breathing thing in front of you. And, and Willie's doing the same. It's just at a much, much higher profile. Yeah, with that much more scrutiny. Just as Willie did run, though, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God, I mean, <laughs> you'd be, what you'd be a, a walk over if he'd run yesterday. So, I mean, heaven forbid, actually. Anyway, well, again, the opportunities for you know to send novice chasers over to pick up decent prize money. Yeah, exactly. Right, the mayor's hurdle. Uh, this came under um, quite intense scrutiny at the beginning of this week because Lossy Mouth, who won the trial so impressively at Cheltenham. I mean, there's no equivocation from connections. She's going to go to the mayor's hurdle, and that's that. And then she might go to Punchestown, and then she might go to the French champion hurdle, which is over quite a trip as well. That's another story. Uh, but it just it opened up the, the debate again as to, as to should you do anything with the conditions of the mayor's hurdle at Cheltenham in order to funnel really talented mayors like Lossie Mouth into the champion hurdle, or do you just leave things as they are? I think... I can't remember how long ago it was, but they, when they've started to improve the mayor's programme massively like they have, if you're going to try to improve the mayor's programme so you have better uh, brood mares, more robust brood mares, a better pool of talent to breed from, you have to let these mares races go and be there. Um, you only have this conversation when there's an exceptional mayor. Uh, Which there have been quite a lot of. Agreed. but. Maybe the reason that there's so many of them is because there, there is a good program for them. And would we need to? You don't need to have the final at the festival, though, do you? Uh, oof. Well, given how important the festival is to all these owners and to everybody into the sport and the fabric of the sport, I'd say you probably do need to have it. Don't you think? Well, Down the line, could you once that once they're developed and established? It's never going to happen, is it? But. Well, it's an interesting concept, though, because it keeps the integrity of the race and it does move it. You know, you could argue the entry hurdle, for example, the two and a half miles. Mm. The festival is richer for not having that intermediate step. So if we widened it out, you could argue that if you're saying Cheltenham is the be all and end all, you do have the opportunity with certain events to move them away from that, that centre. It's not going to happen, I'm sure, but it is certainly a way of diversifying premierising <laughs> and flattening out your major events so they don't all occur at the there, same time. There's all sorts of things you could do. You could make it, you know, a, a rating cap at the top. You could make it a grade two. You could put a penalty structure in there. You could... But if it's meant to identify the champion mayor, mm. then that, you know, altering it to limited handicaps or... You just have to hope that the sportsmanship aspect of once you've won one... Corvega used to stick in your throat a little bit because she always felt that, you know, I know she was really fragile. But, yeah, you know, coming up and just doing the same thing over and over again was a bit repetitive. Annie Parv, to be fair, tried both, you know, tried both. But we, we're getting to the point now where the onus is on owners to really, you know, embrace the sportsmanship of it. I don't think we should be in that position. You know, they shouldn't be the ones who we're imploring. We should have a sport that works correctly and that when the best horses are identified, the be they mares or not, they're yeah, running I think them. that's a fair Comes up deep ground, two and a half miles. It'd be very different conditions to what she faced at Cheltenham. Lossy Mouth would only just make Constitution Hill a better price. <laughs> you, you stood, they, so, from your sort of clinical trainer's mind, I, would, wouldn't, I wouldn't even have her enter it in the champion hurdle. You wouldn't even have her entered because she's she's absolute certainty for the mayor. But by that logic, by that logic, a fan, that's just so. Oh, I'm a massive fan of racing as well, but I'd love to win the mayor's hurdle, and so would Rich Ritchie. I'd keep her entered till the four hour staging. Well, where could you supplement to? Do you know what I mean? Like, as in, I wouldn't even be considering it. Yeah. She's, she, she's, she's the best mayor. The mayor's hurdle is for the best mayors. She's the best. Sir Gino, machine, isn't he? He is. Why are you bothering to enter Give Me Five for the Triumph Hurdle? <laughs> well, because it's the four year old race, isn't it? I've got no other choice. <laughs> <laughs> this juvenile picture is looking a little indistinct outside Sir Gino, though, isn't it? Yeah, I think they've all got a. I think they've, there's a big gap between Sir Gino and the rest. OK, but. At this stage, you know, you've got to live the dream, haven't you? And that, isn't that the whole point? For me with Give Me Five? Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah, I <laughs> live the dream every time I see him come past me on the gallops. But uh, I, watched, um, I watched Cheltenham last week and I was a bit more disappointed after the first because I thought... Phew. But, yeah, like, for, for my owners and, and until, until he doesn't, we're going to believe that we, you know, we can... Like, my view is that I'll probably end up in the Fred Winter mm -hmm. because um, I'd love to be good enough to go and win the Adonis, but I suspect 
on slightly better ground, I might just come up short. So I'll probably end up in the front window. And it's it's quite notable that the the horses that dominate the market for the for the uh, for the Triumph Hurdle tend to be more more jumps type horses now, Maddie. Given the eclipse of Burdett Road last week, I was going to say you saw that comparison starkly, didn't you? With Burdett Road, sort of the little terrier off the flat, the Royal Ascot winner, and then Sergino came and sort of bulldozed him out the way, but. I do think things didn't quite go to plan for Yeah, Bernard I wouldn't Road give up on him yet. Because he's, he was so keen. He really, a bit like Lossy Mouth, actually, down the hill at Cheltenham, he just really grabs hold of the bridle. And the way that race was run, I felt like he was almost always trying to catch his breath. Um, and with that amount I of would speed... I be too chasing Sergino. <laughs> yeah, I think we all would. Um, with that amount of speed, you... It has to be managed, doesn't it, throughout a race. And he's probably not the easiest horse to ride, I don't think. So I wouldn't be surprised if he could do better. But, yeah, as Harry said, Sergino looks brilliant. I think two mile one round the new course, you have to stay very, yeah. very well. Yeah. And I, I, I think Burdett Rose just... He might not. He might not have stayed last time. Yeah. He's a quick horse. He's got a champion hurdle entry. Yes, <laughs> entry. See, entry. Yeah, James, yeah, but that could be the place. James James you know where Harry would be going. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I, I would. Like all stayers generally win the triumph. Two mile one new course as a four year old. And that's why Ruby Walsh, in conversation with Lydia on the road to Cheltenham, said, We think Lossie Math will stay. You've got to be able to stay to win a triumph the way she did. Uh, Patrick Veach, who has had a, a number of um, interesting incarnations in the sport, primarily as a very successful punter, but also as an owner and breeder, is sort of teaming up in a meeting of minds, a sort of strategic alliance with uh, Tony Bloom, uh, the Brighton uh, Football Club Supremo, and again, renowned punter, owner, etc., and Ian McAlevey, as they bid to try and form a breeding operation for the three of them and an ownership operation for um, Bloom and McAlevey. It's quite a formidable meeting of minds, this Richard, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting, and I think it shows the pure market of people of their, you know, very comprehensive mathematical and business acumen can feel they find a niche where they think they can make it pay. I think it's interesting on two fronts. First of all, that potentially that area of um, stamina-laden horses is an area that has been neglected by breeding in this country for sure. Um, so but there's demand out there yep. across the world, and somebody needs to. Yep, you've, you've seen the dominance of Japan really being built around, you know, stouter pedigrees, so maybe that has something to do with it. And the second thing, obviously, we've spent all our time talking about affordability checks, ability to get on, etc. Um, one would imagine that an operation with these particular gentlemen involved would not be averse to um, betting as part of supplementing that. And so, as a consequence, that's an interesting different sort of um, yeah. strategy Although, that we've had. I, I did ask this. Did you? Patrick, and he said this is not a punting vehicle mm. and said that his own punting was now going to transition to with a focus on Hong Kong. Interesting. Okay, well, that's yeah, it was probably a bit late in the day to be heading over to Hong Kong. I think the golden years went there about 20 or 30 years ago. Japan might be slightly different, but um, that, that's interesting. But it's hard to believe that if that's your in your DNA, that uh, if you think you've got one working well at home, that you're not averse to try and get a few quid on. Maddie? Yeah, we talk a lot sort of negatively about racing on this show inevitably, don't we? But uh, it's just great that people are increasing their investment and two people who, you know, have a very serious relationship with the sport are ploughing more money into it. It's a good thing. Any horses for Tony Bloom yet? Not yet. The door's open. <laughs> only, only a matter of time. <laughs> We've ticked off a few today, haven't we? Yeah. So Texas Hold'em, cricket. You've got to have to go yeah. out, yeah, yeah. see if you can pull aces against him. And... How is your poker? Non-existent. Sorry. But what, like your golf? <laughs> <laughs> right, on we move. Um, influencers in the sport. What, why do you look like that? Well, I'm sitting in the presence of one, so I'm, you know, I'm intrigued as to what, you know. <laughs> I, this is an interesting story. I'm, I'm going to let Maddie go first, because I think, you know... Right. OK. Um, the, the reason this is brought up is because there's, been, yeah, there's been some debate this week. Uh, uh, it particularly came out of... There was a, a Horses Up, wasn't there, announced? Riders Up. Yeah. Riders yeah. Up, uh, the sorry, Pegasus right. yes. last week, um, where six and a half million followed, followers followed, I don't know, whatever. Alex Earl was uh, doing the Riders Up. And, she had this, and there seems, it seemed to generate an unusual amount of debate as to whether... Um, social media influence were a good thing for horse racing, Maddie? Yeah, I think you only have to look at any sort of business and the way it's run these days and social media to know that influencing is the future. Um, and, you know, that's how you grab 
young people's attention when it comes to news or selling a product. Um, I think there are legitimate concerns about how that translates, rather than just getting eyes on her and uh, reach, how that translates to actually making new fans of the sport, which is um, a valid question. Um, but at the same time, I think racing's got to move with the times a bit. I don't see why there's this snobbery around it, per se. Um, I think a lot of influencing now is entering mainstream and it's an opportunity for racing to grow and showcase itself to a new audience. And can we really afford to be going, oh, no, we don't want those sorts of people in our sport? No, of course we can't. If you want to be influenced to like horse racing, watch Ryan Moore in the Pegasus, not someone in the paddock. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was very good, wasn't he? That probably deserved a bit more play than it got this week. Did you watch Warm Heart? Richard? Yeah, I did, yeah. Again, just bravery, knowing that your best chance of winning is to stick to the inside running rail. Uh, look, I think you shouldn't be too snobbish, as, as Maddie said. I don't know whether it is Emperor's New Clothes as regards a marketing tool, but it is Flavour of the Month, and if racing doesn't at least investigate it, then it's going to get left behind. Right on the bell. Those were this week's talking points. Uh, time for me to say goodbye, I'm afraid, to, to Harry Derham. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Nick. 18 months has gone by in the blink of an eye. That probably seems like the longest 18 months of your life, doesn't it? No, it's actually gone by quickly. I'm, I'm very lucky. I wake up every morning and I've got a job I absolutely love. So uh, currently living uh, the dream I wanted to for a long time. Excellent. And best of luck with the, the horses for Cheltenham. I'm hoping that uh, Gimme Five and Queen's Gamble both make it. Anything else likely to make it, do you think? Brentford Hope, possibly? If Young Butler uh, won next Saturday at Newbury, then he could... Get into the attempts. And is that a possibility? Strong possibility, yeah. Excellent. Good luck with him. Good luck with them all. Harry, thanks for joining us. Maddie and Richard will be back a little bit later. And after this, I will be welcoming Chris Pitts to the show. Luck on Sunday. Brought to you by Whirlpool. Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.